Nice, yes. Hello, welcome to my talk. My name is Niels Lukas, and it's not fingerprinting, but watermarking. Um, and this was work done at the University of Waterloo with uh, Edward Jiang, Shinda Li, and supervised by Florian Kirschbaum. So what is deep neural network watermarking? Imagine you're a company, and you have training data, and you want to train a model on this training data. And this is a process that outputs a model, and then you want to share this model publicly. So you want to upload it, for example, on Model Hub. Now, you don't want to upload it just as it is, but you want to upload it with a usage agreement. For example, you will allow academic purposes, but you will not allow model misuse. And model misuse, in this case, can be have quite a lot of meanings. For example, one of the meanings that we investigate is commercialization, where you won't allow your model to be commercialized, but it can also be other uh, cases of model misuse. For example, what we just heard, uh, misuse with language models. One possible defense would be to watermark the model and make it detectable that, oh, you used our model, you can't do that, and uh, this is a faulty service. So if we have an adversary that downloads the model from Model Hub and then deploys it publicly, the question is, how can we tell that they used our model? And that is, the question is called provenance verification. This is the question that watermarking seeks to answer. So in watermarking, it's um, an addition to the training process where we embed a message into the uh, trained um, model that makes it recognizable in the other um, deployment from the adversary. So our work studies how reliable watermarking is in practice. So we have five contributions of our paper that I'm going to talk about. So first, we uh, talk about the taxonomy of watermarking. So we looked at a lot of schemes that we found in, in um, uh, research that we found published, and we categorized them in different, into different categories. Then we look at novel adaptive attacks against a subset of these watermarks. And we have a large empirical study where we pit a lot of attacks against a lot of defenses on multiple data sets. And we derive at uh, guidelines on how robustness uh, evaluation can be improved in practice. And finally, all of our source code is open uh, source on GitHub, and I will provide a link at the very end. So first, what is watermarking? So watermarking can de be defined by two functions, namely the embedding and the extraction function. So during the embedding, you have a source model a message and a key. The key can be anything. It can be a vector, it can be images, whatever. And that is the input to the embedding function, which then outputs a marked model. So this marked model then contains a message that can be extracted via the extraction function. So in the extraction function, it takes as an input the marked model and the watermarking key, and it outputs the message. And there is a simple verification process where we speak of the watermark accuracy, which verifies if our extracted message and our embedded message, if they match. If they match up to a certain degree, we say that this model was stolen and this was our model and check if it was maybe misused. Okay, so we looked at a lot of schemes, as I said, and we de uh, derived a taxonomy for them. So we have, four, we have found four categories. So one is uh, one type of uh, watermarking schemes we call white box watermarking schemes. Here, the defender has access to the weights during verification. So they take the watermarking key, they take the, wa the model's weights, and then from that, they derive the message. The other three watermarking schemes are so-called black box watermarking schemes, where the defender, to verify, only has access to the images uh, and the model as a service. So they would send an image to the model, and get the classification of that image back, but nothing more. So the first of these black box watermarking schemes we call model independent watermarking. So here the gist, this is like one very simplified scheme, is we have a watermarking key, which is just some images randomly sampled, let's say from the internet, some randomly sampled target labels, and we teach the model, we backdoor the model essentially, to predict a certain label for each image. If the stolen model predicts the same label, we interpret that as a match, and we uh, decode that as a one in the message. Then there's model-dependent watermarking that mostly, most of the schemes that we looked at depend on adversarial examples. Here, 
the defender would adversarially train the source model, and then we would check if the deployed model is, vulner is uh, vulnerable to the adversarial attack or not. If the deployed model is not vulnerable to the attack, then we decode that as a one and otherwise as a zero in the message. And finally, there's active watermarking. So active watermarking is purely a post-processing step to the model where the um, watermarking function has access both to the input and all intermediate activations, and then it outputs a label. And then with a certain probability, it can output a false label, and then we can uh, see if someone trains a model on these false labels, um, if they stole our model. So in total, as I said, we looked at 11 watermarking schemes that are listed here. Unfortunately, I cannot go into detail for all of them, but they all depend on different functionalities to claim robustness. Okay, so the same taxonomy also exists for the attacker. So now we have an attacker that took a model, that downloaded a model, and they want to corrupt the message that a defender would read from the model. So here we have three categories. So the first are input pre-processing attacks, where the attacker takes the image, perturbs it, and then passes it forward to the stolen model. And here, for example, we have input noising, where they just add random noise, or input smoothing, where they blur the image uh, effectively. Then we have model modification attacks, which uh, some of the well-known ones might be neural cleanse for those working with backdoors, or neural laundering, which is specifically tailored against uh, watermarks. Uh, and finally, we have model extraction attacks, where the attacker takes the model, he downloads the, the stolen model, and then uses a distillation, a knowledge distillation approach to train a different model. So model extraction attacks, they can even change the model architecture, and we still want to be able to tell that the information from our model was used in the stolen model. So we, in the paper, we describe uh, adaptive attacks, and three of them are listed here. And um, I will be showing the results uh, in subsequent slides. So we need to answer two questions, essentially. So first, what does it mean to be robust? Like, I talked about the watermark accuracy, but how large does the watermark accuracy have to be? So here we see two distributions. On the x-axis is the watermark accuracy, and on the y-axis is the probability of, the, of observing this watermark accuracy. So we see that both these functions, they're separable. Now, if we see a model in the wild and it has a watermark accuracy lower than the decision threshold, we say it wasn't stolen, otherwise it is stolen. But determining this um, un uh, unmarked watermark accuracy can be very hard if the watermark uses things like adversarial attacks. Because with adversarial attacks, we have properties such as transferability, and then it's very hard to know how unmarked models react to this. And many schemes that we evaluated, they didn't give a method to evaluate um, or, or to uh, determine the decision threshold. So what we do is we created a generic method where we train a lot of unmarked models and then empirically measure the decision thresholds. And what we find is that there's large differences across data sets for a single scheme. So on the x-axis, we see all the schemes, the 11 schemes that we look at. And also, for between schemes, we also see large differences. So here, GIA has a very low decision threshold, whereas Frontier Stitching, or FS, has a very high one. So now we take all these values, and in order to compare the schemes with each other, we scale all the values according to this decision threshold to 0 0.5, meaning if we measure watermark accuracy lower than 0 0.5, or 50%, we say that it, the scheme is not robust. Okay, the second question that we need to answer is what setting for the defender and what setting for the attacker uh, do we boil robustness down to? So a de defender, for example, can instantiate a watermark with different parameters. Now, what if one set of parameters leads to a different optimal strategy for the attacker? So this is where the Nash equilibrium comes in. So we de designed a payoff matrix where we write the test accuracy for successful attacks, so attacks that remove the watermark, and otherwise we, we write minus infinity, and then we compute the, the Nash equilibrium for the attacker and the defender, which is their optimal strategies. And then we look at two scenarios. So one scenario is one scheme versus all attacks. So here the attacker knows the defense, and the second is all schemes versus all attacks. 
where um, the attack, neither the attacker nor the defender know which strategies was used by the other party. So now our uh, empirical analysis starts. So we, I will only present the results on ImageNet, which is a large image classification data set with 1,000 classes and 1.28 million images. So what we see first is for the model extraction attacks, we need a lot of data to steal a model with a high test accuracy. So that's on the x-axis, we have the amount of unlabeled training data. And on the y-axis, we have the test accuracy, and the blue box is an acceptable, quote-unquote acceptable, um, test accuracy. So we see that um, for model modification attacks, we limit the attacker to about a third of the unlabeled training data, whereas the model extraction attacker has access to all of the unlabeled training data. Because if they had less, they couldn't train, uh, they couldn't train a model. They couldn't extract it with high enough accuracy. So we look at the um, schemes and the embedding times of the watermarking schemes. So in general, we observe that embedding is not a problem. It's very fast. So on the x-axis um, is always the time. And on the less left graph, we have at most one and a half hours, which is absolutely fast. Whereas for the attacker, they need a lot more time to run some of these attacks. So the dashed vertical line is the training time of the defender from scratch. And we can see that some attacks take more time, more training time than the, attack, uh, than the defender used to train their model from scratch. So the next thing we're looking at is how much does the embedding uh, impact the test accuracy of the model. And we see that generally this is also good, but it again depends a little bit on the use case. So for our cases, we saw mostly a drop of less than 1% of test accuracy, except for one scheme which had three and a half, I believe. Um, percent lower test accuracy. Okay, our main result of this paper is that a lot of the schemes, or all of the schemes that we observed were not robust in practice against a highly capable attacker. So on the x-axis we have what we call the stealing loss, which is the loss uh, that the attacker has when he steals the model. And on the y-axis we have the watermark accuracy. And as I said, it's scaled, so everything that's lower then 0.5 um, means it's not robust, and none of the schemes is robust, and the best scheme incurs a test accuracy drop of 3%. So we, we also see that the attacker doesn't need, to, uh, doesn't need to spend a lot of runtime to remove these attacks, especially our adaptive attacks are really fast at removing the watermark. And there's only two schemes where the only attacks that remove the watermark are model extraction attacks, namely transfer learning attacks. So, as a takeaway, robustness is very hard to achieve, and it, it, it might be impossible to achieve robustness of watermarking against this highly capable attacker. So, for robustness, it's, it's crucial that we define the capabilities of the attacker very accurately. So, we have four guidelines. Now, in this presentation, in the paper, there's some more, so check that out if, you're, uh, if you want more details. So the first one is always derive a method to compute the decision threshold. That is a major component of claiming robustness is to exactly specify what the decision threshold is. Second, show limitations of your watermark. Break it, right? Like assume a very strong attacker and break the watermark to show up the limitations. None of the surveyed watermarks was robust and yours probably isn't either given that there's a highly capable attacker. State assumption about the attacker's data set. We found that an attacker with a lot of data also has a lot of power, and this is always unlabeled data. And finally, we, we would um, prefer to see an ablation study with the Nash equilibrium for an attacker to get a complete um, view of the robustness of the data set, uh, of the watermark, sorry. And that concludes our presentation. Feel free to check out our source code on GitHub, and I'm happy to receive any questions. Hello, um, Haroon from UC Davis. In the past, I've come across some papers that have talked about watermarking as a clean label attack, if you're familiar with poison frogs. Mm -hmm. And my question is that 
in an attempt to make watermarking the model more robust so the model can't be stolen, are you actually empowering these attacks to become better as well? Um, so I'm not familiar with poison frogs. As you so said, I... this was an attack demonstrated by like a paper in 2012, which was you could manipulate an image and an online model would then pick up that image which would poison its internal, whatever it's learned so far. They demonstrated that they could get some ResNet model to see images of dogs as frogs. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So then right. they basically manipulated the image to like introduce a watermark in it, which would mislead the classifier. Mm -hmm. And the question is if we should make attacks better in order so to evaluate robustness. If you're making it more robust with this study, does that inadvertently make those attacks more robust as well? Um, so I think one of the, I think the limitations aren't really the attacks. I do think that adaptive attacks, I mean, they're very hard to find. You cannot ask someone who, who designs and publishes a defense to cover all the adaptive attacks. So what we would ask of them is to look at the adaptive attacks that we know exist in practice, choose appropriate parameters, ideally an ablation study over them, and then show the robustness for it. But actually, it's, an, it's a very important point. A takeaway from this paper is not necessarily that you have to redesign our study, like take all attacks that we looked at, and then run them against the watermark that you're designing. I think that would put a lot of strain on, on anyone wanting to propose a new defense. I think the takeaway is more that we showed which attacks particularly break a subset of these watermarks or, or uh, watermarks specifically. So for, for, for us, the takeaway should be look where your water, like what, what are the closest other watermarks to your watermark, look what they are vulnerable to, and then show your performance specifically against that subset of attacks. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, if there are mo no more questions, let's thank Niels again.